So I'm delighted to welcome you to this IIA webinar. The IIA is honoured to be joined today by Lord Patton of Barnes, Chris Patton, who has made time in his diary to be with us today. Uh, I'm Bobby McDonough, former Irish uh, diplomat, and I'm delighted to have been asked to chair this event. Lord Patton will be speaking about China's international role and its evolution in recent decades. And in that context, he will talk about the actions of China in Hong Kong and give us his thoughts on how the UK and the international community should respond. Lord Patton will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go into Q&A with our audience. The whole event will last one hour. And Chris has told me that he's very open to taking questions on topics other than China, including on British politics. So you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. So please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will take as many of them as possible after Lord Patton's presentation. Uh, Chris has also said that he's happy for the whole presentation and Q&A to be on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Chris Patton is truly somebody who needs no introduction. He is probably the only person who, during his lifetime, has been addressed as Honourable Member, Minister, Secretary of State, Governor, Commissioner, Chairman, Lord and Chancellor. As far as today's topic is concerned, his periods as the last Governor of Hong Kong and as European Commissioner for External Relations are of particular relevance. And of course, in Ireland, we always remember Chris's role in bringing peace to this island, including as Chair of the Independent Commission on Policing for Northern Ireland. So Chris, I'm delighted to give you the floor. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed, and thanks for the invitation to talk to this uh, um, important and interesting group again, which I've done in the past, though not uh, uh, using technology to do so. But thank you very much for the invitation. I've been asked to, to do China in, up to, in less than 20 minutes, which requires me to do what, um, to give you what Dennis Healy used to call a tour de gloss. Um, uh, I'll obviously um, skim over some things, but I thought I'd try to set um, Hong Kong in the context of what I say more generally about, um, about China. Um, the handover of Hong Kong to China from Britain um, as a result of the fact that the lease on part of the new territories was only signed for 99 years, the assumption being, I suppose, that 99 never came around, was both politically and morally difficult both for China and for Britain. Um, politically difficult because um, for both parties, there was some embarrassment. Embarrassment in the way that Hong Kong had been acquired in the 19th century, partly as a result of the um, way in which the imperial powers had behaved towards the uh, Qing dynasty, partly because of um, Britain's attempts to pay for um, Chinese tea um, for, and pay for India uh, by uh, globalizing uh, China through the forced sale of opium to China. I'm slightly overdoing it, um, but not by, by much. Um, so it was politically difficult for both sides because it was an embarrassing element in both, um, both parties' history. Morally difficult for other reasons. Morally difficult for the Chinese because more than half the population of Hong Kong were themselves refugees from Chinese communism, um, right from the beginning. Uh, the people who brought the watch trade, textiles, shipping to Hong Kong from Shanghai. But later on, more than half the population were people who'd fled um, the events of modern communist history, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, um, the, uh, the, the tyrannous behavior of Mao and some of his successors. Um, they had swum to Hong Kong, they clamber over, over razor barbed wire to get to this safe haven, rather humiliatingly from, for the Chinese, for Chinese nationalist communists, uh, rather humiliatingly um, a British colony. Difficult morally for Britain because unlike every other colony, we weren't, or pretty well every other colony, we weren't preparing Hong Kong for independence with democracy and the usual constitutional kit borrowed from uh, Professor Jennings. We weren't uh, doing that. We weren't able to do it. 
every time there were suggestions that we should go faster in democratization in Hong Kong, and in my view, we should have gone rather faster, but every time it happened, the Chinese would, would line up and say, you mustn't do that because it'll give people in Hong Kong the idea that they're gonna be treated like Singapore or Malaysia, uh, and come 1997, they're gonna be independent. They're not, they're coming back to us. So there was a sort of um, malign agreement between some in Britain and some in the business community in Hong Kong that developing democracy would be a bad thing and pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. Against that background, Deng Xiaoping's idea of one country, two systems, which was originally designed to try to accommodate Taiwan, was a brilliant way through. Um, and it was incorporated in an international treaty called the Joint Declaration, and then was translated into a sort of mini constitution for Hong Kong written by China called the Basic Law. And what it basically did was to guarantee Hong Kong's freedoms, Hong Kong's rule of law, Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy, to borrow from the texts, from 1997 to 2047. Um, and uh, that would be the backdrop to, um, to uh, uh, Britain's transfer of sovereignty. Um, we did quite a bit in the run up to 1997 to try to embed um, Bill of Rights uh, issues like the introduction of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was actually put into Hong Kong's basic law, Bill of Rights, getting rid of some of the old colonial legislation, which had been used, for example, during the Cultural Revolution riots in 1967. Uh, we did all that. We, we didn't actually um, increase the pace of democratization or increase the pace of the introduction of directly elected seats to the LegCo. Uh, the only thing I did was to try to make the elections as fair and free as possible by increasing the number of votes in functional constituencies. In other words, the constituencies of which um, reflected the, law, the lawyers or the agricultural workers or the textile workers. Come 1997, um, I think we were mostly quite confident that Hong Kong wouldn't do too badly. And the conference was, um, I think, justified for the first 10 or a dozen years. Not everything went well, but by and large, China kept to its side of the bargain. Um, uh, there were one or two um, shortcomings. It slowed down the promises it had made, reversed the promises it had made on the development of democracy. There were occasional interferences. And in 20, 2003, there was an attempt to introduce a national security law, which led to demonstrations by about 500,000 people and eventually to the fall of the then chief executive, and they backed off. Now, th this opens up an issue which has been much talked about, the, uh, the suggestion that Hong Kong needs a national security law because that was promised or suggested in the, in the uh, basic law, Hong Kong's mini constitution, uh, and was never, was never uh, done. It's absolute nonsense. There are lots of laws in Hong Kong dealing with treason, um, dealing with terrorism, it's the crimes audience. I mean, it's the crimes audience and other things which have led to the arrest of um, about 900,000 people since the demonstrations began uh, last year. Um, what China has objected to is that it hasn't been allowed to define what national security should be for the people of Hong Kong. Now, things went pretty well, I think, until um, Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping is, I think, a different leader to his predecessors. I've dealt in my time both as governor and Hong Kong with, with Jiang Zemin. I was his personal guest in, in, uh, in China on a trip with my wife, with Zhu Rongji, who's the cleverest um, international public servant I met, with Wen Jiabo, who was prime minister, with Hu Jintao. I've worked with them all and they were tough and their officials were very, very difficult to to negotiate with, but I think this is a different leader. Chris, something? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. It froze there for, I think it froze about, about 30 seconds ago, so you can continue again. Okay, can you, can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear you now, yeah. Okay. Um, Xi Jinping is very different. He's an old-fashioned dictator, um, and I think he's uh, assembled more power and more centralization for two reasons. First of all, I think the leadership were spooked by Bo Xi Lai's attempt to muscle his way into the Standing Committee of the Politburo, 
a few years ago. Bo Xilai is the, is the former mayor of Chongqing, whose wife, you may recall, uh, was um, sentenced for murder a British businessman. Um, and the other thing which I think is, is apparent is increasing nervousness during the period of Howe's presidency that the Chinese communist regime was starting to lose its grip over things um, as the economy was opening up, as technology was increasing information flows. So I think uh, Xi Jinping has been determined both to crack down on what's happening in China and as part of that to turn the screw in Hong Kong. I think what he has also done recently is to take advantage of the fact that the rest of the world is focused uh, on the uh, fighting the coronavirus, which of course became worse because of China's failure to meet its international obligations, um, agreed after the SARS epidemic, um, to declare what was happening earlier, the international health regulations of 2005 to 2007, um, and I think that Xi Jinping has been trying to take advantage of, of the fact that everybody's attention elsewhere. And also, per, per, perhaps, taking account of the importance of trying to whip up nationalist sentiment to sustain the communist regime. Um, he's, he's behaved um, pretty loutishly all around the region and around the world. Somebody the other day, when we were talking about the importance of standing up for Hong Kong, for moral and political reasons, Somebody, actually, the chairman of Chatham House, said that uh, if we wanted to rebuild the economy, the last thing we should do is pick a, pick a fight with China. The point is that China is picking a fight with everybody. It's picked a fight with Indians, with 20 uh, Indians, uh, recently soldiers, killed on the frontier. It's picked a fight with Japan. It's picked a fight with the Malaysians, the Vietnamese, the Filipinas, by the way it's been behaving in the South China Sea, which it claims sovereignty over, despite the fact that the Hague Tribunal um, said that that was, uh, was not the case. Uh, it's picked a fight with Australia, because Australia pressed for a, a full independent inquiry um, into the origins of the coronavirus. It's picked a fight with Canada, um, because of a, an extradition case involving um, an executive of Huawei in Canada. So it's actually gone in for hostage diplomacy, rather as though it was one of those um, ramshackle uh, states in the Middle East or Western Asia. It picked fights all around the world, and in Hong Kong, it's decided to double down on, on the issue of national security and threatened the, the, uh, the territory with a national security law, which has finally been, uh, been delivered um, today. The British Foreign Secretary today, in a very precise and legalistic way, which I think was sensible, set out all the ways in which this pr proposed national security law infringes the joint declaration um, and infringes the basic law. Um, imposed on Hong Kong, partly because the Chinese communists didn't think that they were capable of getting it through the Legislative Council in any way, want to disqualify legislators who don't accept the national security law in order to stop pan-democrats winning in the elections in in september uh, it's uh, uh, it, it brings in uh, national security agents to actually supervise things in hong kong it cracks down on on the media it cracks down uh, on the on the internet um, it, there are aspects of territory of, of extraterritoriality in it so that you can be prosecuted under it even if you're not um, chinese or a hong kong citizen um, you can be prosecuted for things that uh, you said or did outside um, uh, Hong Kong, it would appear. The whole legislation is drafted. I, I reread last summer on holiday, I reread re George Orwell's 1984. And this legislation, when you read it, reads right like, read, read, reads just like um, an Orwellian uh, description of how you make the law. Um, the crimes are not specified except by the Chinese when they want to specify them. And it's plainly the case that some cases will be taken out of Hong Kong and tried in China and dealt with in China. So we go back to the whole issue of extradition, which, which triggered the protests last year, which had 1.7 million people uh, on the streets uh, and which led to the, uh, an increase in concerns about democracy and increasing concerns about, about policing which produced, I think, some of the 
turmoil and turbulence, or most of the turmoil and turbulence of last year. It also um, makes clear that from now on, the chief executive advised by Chinese national security officials will choose the judges to, uh, cr to try these cases under the national security law. There is no guarantee that the trials will be in the open. There's no guarantee that there will be, there will be uh, jury trials. So uh, in, in almost every respect, uh, I think this is a flagrant assault on the rule of law. It tries to, to meld, or not to meld, but it tries to oversee um, the, the common law with Chinese law. Um, and uh, it, it's, um, uh, it threatens a lot of the things which have made Hong Kong so successful and, and prosperous. Um, it's already the case that a lot of hedge funds are talking about how they can do their job um, if they're not absolutely certain that when they report on the real scale, for example, of, uh, of uh, China's um, unemployment or China's um, uh, 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 trade figures or whatever, that they'll find themselves potentially um, threatened under this law for, uh, for saying things which the Chinese government doesn't like. It looks as though even complaining that the police um, uh, uh, about police behavior in Hong Kong, and I know quite a lot about public order policing because of what Bobby mentioned uh, earlier in Northern Ireland. It looks as though even doing that will be regarded as whipping up hatred uh, of uh, Beijing. Altogether, I think it's pretty ghastly. And I think uh, it's not only, a, uh, not, only brief, not only ends one country, two systems, but I think threatens to be very bad for um, Hong Kong's ability to continue its role as a very important Asian financial hub. Two or three other things about it. As I said at the outset, I think this has to be seen as a pattern of behavior by the Chinese uh, communist regime. And on the whole, it's got away with this behavior over the years um, by picking off countries one at a time. Australia one week, Canada the next, Britain the next, um, India the next, uh, Japan or, or others um, the following week. And I think it's very important that we stand up together, not starting a new Cold War with China, but just making absolutely clear that we will call out China when it behaves badly. Um, and I think Britain has a particular responsibility in helping uh, to ensure that that happens. In some respects, it's made more difficult by the fact that the so-called leader of the West, um, the uh, American president uh, or the present American president doesn't seem to believe very much in allies and alliances. But I do think it's remarkable the extent to which Chinese behavior has solidified opinion in Washington about how to deal with China, just as it's done so, just as it's done in, in the UK. To find myself in the same, uh, in the same uh, uh, argument or on the same side in argument with Ian Duncan Smith or whatever is a new and wonderful experience for me. But that's thanks, thanks to China because we find ourselves, for example, supporting the UK government as have 26 other countries in the human rights in the UN Human Rights Council in the last day or so, not only criticizing what China is doing in Hong Kong, but also criticizing what seems to be the beginning of genocide in Xinjiang with forced sterilization, forced uh, IUD, uh, ID, forced abortions, all of which has been reported extremely fully and very well by the Associated Press, who will doubtless, doubtless suffer the consequences for telling the truth. So, it's not surprising that uh, the EU even has found uh, it, it able to, it, itself able to make a very critical um, set of statements about what, what uh, China had been doing. Um, Australia, Canada, um, US, UK, the G7 as a whole, Japan, India, and India has just reacted to uh, Chinese behavior by uh, banning, I think, 59 different Chinese apps like TikTok, which were previously um, uh, very successful in India. So I repeat, I'm not in favor of, of a cold war with China. What I am in favor of is what um, an old uh, and very good uh, international relations expert, some of you will be old enough to remember him, called Gerald Siegel, who died, alas, um, ridiculously young. Uh, 
who used to talk, he used to talk about constrainment, about working together so that when China was doing things you approved of, uh, you'd uh, react very well to it. And there's all sorts of things we need to negotiate with China, whether um, on climate change or preventing the next pandemic of antimicrobial resistance. Those are things we have where we have to work uh, with China. But when China behaves badly, we need to contain, we need to call it out, and we need to work together uh, in order to uh, uh, try to ensure that China understands there are consequences for what it's doing. I think in Britain at the moment, there's been a complete change in the debate about Huawei, partly because of um, seeing how China has been behaving and increasing disbelief that a company which is as involved as Huawei is in the surveillance state in Xinjiang can't be regarded as just any other multinational. So um, China is a great country, a very important country, um, but the Chinese Communist Party is a threat. Um, and uh, I think it's particularly dangerous for all of us that China has demonstrated with what it's been doing in the last few months, and particularly in Hong Kong, that you can't trust it. Turn it gloss over. Thank you very much, Chris. That's thank you. That's a fascinating presentation. And uh, we have questions coming in here now. So um, uh, there's a question from Rory Quinn, uh, whom you probably know. He's former leader of the Labour Party, former Minister of Finance. I have his over there behind me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he says that you were uh, you refers to the fact you were instrumental in, in presiding over the transfer of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty, and he asks, what were your expectations at the time? Did you expect the new arrangement would stay in place without any change? I hoped it would. Um, I didn't ever really think that um, the equivalent of the Chinese KGB would uh, um, be given um, uh, a carte blanche in uh, Hong Kong, which is happening. And I didn't expect that the tanks would be rolling in as they did in Tiananmen Square. Um, I thought the worst I thought would happen would be that um, Hong Kong would simply become the richest city in China, um, but without the freedoms which had made it so special. I'm now um, more concerned because I think some of the things that have made Hong Kong so uh, extraordinarily well off, though I think that that economic success hasn't been particularly well managed in the last few years, and the social inequity in Hong Kong has grown quite, quite uh, considerably. I now worry that some of the things that are happening will actually undermine Hong Kong's prosperity. Not because of the Americans, for example, deciding that they can no longer treat Hong Kong as being economically autonomous or different than China, though that will be um, hurtful um, a little, but because of what Beijing is doing. And I think that, that, I think that um, uh, Xi Jinping regards Hong Kong as representing all the things he hates. When I spoke about Peter Sutherland um, in uh, Dublin a few months ago, I quoted a document which uh, Xi Jinping had sent out to all his um, uh, political and government officials um, in 2013, called again, by the Orwellian title, Communique Number no. 9 in which he listed all the appalling things which liberal democracy represented and why the Chinese Communist Party had to be vigilant in fighting them. And when you look at them, most of them um, exemplified, institutionalized in Hong Kong. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religious worship, um, si si very healthy civic order organizations, um, uh, proper education, um, not um, uh, the sort of education which will um, convince people that Tiananmen never happened. Those are the sort of things which I think the Chinese Communist Party finds so dangerous in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, I hope they will be able to survive, though with the present leadership in Hong Kong, it's pretty questionable. Thank you. Could I just ask anybody who's submitting uh, questions to identify yourselves and to give your affiliation? Uh, that would be very helpful. I have a question from Dan O'Brien, uh, an economist with the IIEA, 
who asks, how different are the US and European stances towards Hong Kong and who is closest to getting it right at this stage? Well, it depends whether you believe John Bolton or not. <laughs> I mean, um, I suspect that a, a new American administration and the um, and Europe could work together well on on uh, uh, on Hong Kong and on China. Um, I was I did a, a seminar like like this the other day um, with Orville Shell and a group of Americans and a group of European parliamentarians and was very struck except in this security area um, where there were some differences by the commonality of view on what's happening in China and I think it's it's very important that that continues I, I think inevitably European statements and I've said this before when I used to be partly responsible for trying to police them European statements on difficult foreign policy issues tend to be very strong on nouns and adjectives but rather weak on verbs and I think that the that the statement which came out the other day from the European Union on Hong Kong was in that sense remarkably strong by European standards and I very much welcomed what both the President of the Commission and the President of the Council had to say. There are of course some, some uh, uh, who are um, dragging their feet on these issues. I think one of, there are one or two um, EU countries which have been um, seduced by the hope of vast funds under the Belt and Roads Initiative, um, uh, which um, I think is actually a, a pretty good example of debt diplomacy by, by China, as people like the Pakistanis and, and others are discovering at the moment. But by and large, I think it's possible to shape a sensible policy uh, on China, which is in the same ballpark as what a sensible American administration would be doing. Look, our value system, um, even with a, with a president like this one, is closer to that in the uh, United States um, than it is with China. Um, we don't want to have to choose between the United States and China. Um, I'm sure that a Biden administration, you think about the people who would be part of a Biden administration. You know, you'd have people like Bill Burns and Susan Rice and so on, uh, making the, doing, calling the shots in terms of international policy. And I think that we'd be much closer to the sort of view which Europeans have of the world. So I, I don't um, think that uh, there, is, there are aspects of sinophobia which would um, separate us, because I think sinophobia is, is appalling, is, 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 is as bad as any um, racist phobia. But I think we shouldn't have too much difficulty in finding common ground in our dislike of Chinese communism and our dislike of the way that this regime behaves in relation to international rules and international agreements. Thank you. I'm going to take a question um, on a subject other than China now. The questions are still coming in on China. Um, Cathy O'Toole, who was, of course, a member of your Patent, patent Commission uh, on establishing the new structures for police in Northern Ireland, and Robert Pierce, the Secretary to the Commission, had an article in yesterday's Washington Post, which suggested that some of the structures which you recommended uh, for policing in Northern Ireland could now be applied in some cities in the United States to address the current policing issues there. Do you have any thoughts on that suggestion? Yeah, yes, I, I, I do. I mean, it, it's... It's interesting that when we were writing that report, we had a couple of two or three visits, um, number of members of our team um, to the United States to discuss policing. Um, uh, finding, of course, that most of the police commissioners we were, we were talking to in individual cities were from the Irish diaspora, rather like my stepfather's um, uh, uh, uncles, um, people like Bill Bratton and so on. But you go to city after city, uh, and find that the the that the, um, the commissioner of police came from an Irish from an Irish heritage, um, and it's a terrible sadness uh, what's happened in some American cities. And I think the, the 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 two things which I would most underline, which were important, though not uncontroversial, or well, three. First of all, the definition of the human rights responsibilities of police services which came to some people as a tremendous shock 
there was, as I recall, um, a leading article, and I think it was the Times, not even the Telegraph, saying, what did we mean by all this? I mean, it, policing was about um, law and order and bonking people on the head. It wasn't about human the wet human rights issue. Secondly, I think another issue that we got absolutely right was the importance of a vigorous police complaints um, body, something that would be nice to have in, in Hong Kong. And I think that is, is really important. And thirdly, uh, the other thing which I think is, is um, uh, I I incredibly important is recruitment. Probably the most controversial thing we did was, uh, was uh, going away from uh, equal, um, from recruitment simply on the basis of uh, what um, recruiting officers thought made sense and trying to ensure that there was a specific proportion of the police service recruited who were Catholic. Um, otherwise, we'd never have moved away from a situation in which only 7% of the police force were, were Catholic. And I think we did very well getting up to about 30% today. And I think that sometimes you have to intervene in that sort of affirmative way in order to really change an institution and change it, change it culturally. Um, I think the, the fact that our policing proposals have lasted is, is a great deal the result of the wisdom from Cathy O'Toole, from Bob himself, who was the secretary of the commission, from uh, uh, Maurice Hayes, from Peter Smith, all of, and John Smith, who was a policeman himself, a metropolitan deputy commissioner. We had some, we had a really good, uh, committee and um, I'm it's I think the thing I'm proudest of doing the most difficult but also the proudest thing um, I, I'm, I, I've been I've done I think um, and uh, it's sad to see um, how much things seem to have gone backwards in some American cities so just just on on that point in particular on race um, when I went to, the, to America for the first time in 1965 as a student, we were in Mont Montgomery, Alabama, and there was a very tense atmosphere because um, a couple of weeks before, three University of Pennsylvania students had been shot dead um, in uh, civil rights demonstrations. And we happened to have picked up at the airport a car with, universe with Philadelphia number plates, so um, we were regarded with some suspicion. That was then. Then roll forward to the night that um, Obama's, Obama was elected. And I happened to be in Hong Kong delivering a speech for a shed load of money um, alongside Colin Powell, who I'd worked with uh, when he was, when I was external affairs commissioner in, in, uh, in Brussels. So I knew him very well and he had a huge admiration for him. And when Colin, I was watching the Obama election, he was crying. It was an extraordinary transformation from 1965, from civil rights demonstrations to electing a, a, a person of color, um, a black American president. And I think it's hugely sad that things seem to have been going backwards in some respects in the last few years. Because it matters to all of us, because if we're going to be able to be more formidable in the case we put for liberal democracy, not only in relation to China, but in relation to what's happening in Europe. If we're gonna be more formidable out that, about that, we have to be much better at dealing with the, um, with the beams or moats in our own eye and dealing with situations in our own societies. Thank you very much. I have lots of fascinating questions coming in. Alan Dukes, um, also a former finance minister and former Fine Gael leader, uh, asks, and I suppose this is partly in the context of the fact Ireland has just been elected to the Security Council of the UN from next year. He said, would there be any benefit in escalating concerns about Hong Kong to the UN Security Council level? Yes, there would. They, of course, it would, they'd, be, they'd be vetoed by, by China and, and Russia. But I, I think in every respect, actually trying to elevate concern in international organisations is really important. Seven UN, as I think I said earlier, seven UN human rights organizations have raised concerns about what's happening in China. 51 UN special rapporteurs have said there should be um, a, uh, a special UN envoy uh, on, uh, on Hong Kong. 
Um, I think it's really important that we should raise these issues. Um, and of course, it's true that the Chinese communists, the wolf warriors, um, won't like it. But I think we actually have to show them that we're not afraid to stand up for ourselves. Otherwise, they'll go on rolling over us. Um, just as the Russians did to a very considerable extent in the wake of uh, Putin's KGB takeover of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I much recommend Catherine Belton, uh, her recent book on, on Putin and Putin's people. So you, you get rolled over by, by bullies unless you stand up to them. Um, and that, that's, that's um, a lesson which in Europe we should remember from Agadir, from, uh, from the Saarland, and in, the, in terms of United Kingdom history, the way we behaved in the 1920s in relation to Ireland. Chris, there's another uh, question on a different topic from Terry Neal, who's a member of the board of the IAEA. And he says that a recent British speaker at the IAEA suggested that the Tory party has now become the English National Party. Is there truth in his comment? Yeah, there is some, there is some truth in it. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's deeply disturbing. Um, I think that um, it, it's something which is, which is crept up um, partly under the guise of concern about Britain's role in the world and Brexit. But I think there is some, some truth in it. Um, and I think that's worrying if, if, if you are as concerned as I am to keep the United Kingdom together. Um, when you look at the way the coronavirus has been handled, um, I'm not sure how many observers would put up their hands and say that they thought it had been better handled by um, Mr. Johnson than by Nicola Sturgeon. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, there are clearly differences to the way it's been handled in Wales and Northern Ireland and the way it's been handled in, uh, in, in England. Uh, and, and to a very considerable extent, the vocabulary, the language, used um, has been uh, related to, I think, uh, English nationalism. I think we suffer in uh, England. Um, we're trapped between two views of our history, one of which, um, and we've seen it recently in the arguments about the, the Cecil Rhodes statue, which I know about all too much. Mm -hmm. There are some people who think that everything we did in the past was terrible. Um, that, that, the, um, that the British Empire was one crime after another. And you can think of all sorts of things which are awful, but not everything was bad. On the other hand, there were those who think we're exceptional, that everything we've done has been brilliant, thanks to, thanks to the English genius. And that's obviously rubbish too. I just wish people knew a bit more history and were better at their history and, and understood the extent to which, for example, in relation to Europe, so much of our history has been intimately tied up with Europe. I'll give you one example. Um, every country has these things of which it's fantastically proud and understandably. And one of the great landmarks in our history is the Battle of Waterloo. There's a great book by Brendan Sims on the Battle of Waterloo, in which he points out that 36% of the soldiers who began the battle, not, not including Blucher at the end, 36% of the soldiers who began the battle, and particularly the soldiers who uh, uh, defended that farmhouse, um, La Aisant, La, La e were German speakers. That was their first language. They were Germans. So you could argue that the Battle of Waterloo was the first triumph for NATO. Uh, of course, um, uh, Wellington was uh, an important figure, but it's an actual example of how one thing after another, whether it's cultural or political or security, um, has our has English as well as Scottish and, and Irish nationality is all tied up together. The 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 way in which I rem I remember quite a lot of of the of the Northern Ireland Unionist culture, the way in which it tried to um, overlook the number of of soldiers from the Republic who died in the First World War and the Second as well. That wonderful novel by, by, um, uh, by Sebastian Barry about it, a, a long way to go. So um, I, th I think there are, there's a real problem for, for British politicians in underlining the fact that we're not rubbishing our own country, that we're proud of so much that 
um, that, that Britain's achieved. But we're real about it, and we, we don't think that there's a sort of English exceptionalism. If there is an English exceptionalism at the moment, I'm afraid it's that we've, I think, dealt with the coronavirus exceptionally badly. Yeah, I'm not sure you could make a direct parallel between the Battle of Waterloo and the first manifestation of NATO, given that I think 30% of Wellington's troops were from Ireland. So uh, I'd like to uh, put two, two related questions to you. One is of my own, the first one, and the second is from Noel Fahey, former Irish ambassador to Washington. Um, I think you've written that the Chinese have used the COVID epidemic to break their commitments in Hong Kong. I just wonder to what extent it may have used Brexit also uh, with the weakening of the UK's international authority. And the second question from Noel Fahey is, would the UK now be able to take concrete action against China, given its preference for building its future on trading beyond Europe? Well, let me, let me um, deal with that point first. Um, I'm very much in favour of what uh, um, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee under Tom Tugendhat, who's an excellent man, um, and others like Charles Parkin from the Royal United Services Institute have written and argued. I'm very much in favour of a British Prime Minister having a committee which coordinates our policy uh, on China and looks right across the board um, at, for example, at some of the arguments that are used which try to convince people that we can't do anything other than, than, um, and, than, than kowtow when um, China comes calling. People say we're so dependent on Chinese investment, we can't, um, we can't uh, um, make a fuss about it. Well, um, there's, a, there's a very good report written by a man called Michael Pettit about suggesting that actually Chinese investment is investment which would have come here anyway because um, uh, the Chinese invest in things they can make money out of. The Chinese investment in Britain isn't a, a sort of bon bouche from the um, a St. Vincent de Paul Society. The Chinese invest in things they can make money from. And as for trade, we have a huge deficit with China on trade. Our, the size of our deficit with China is the same size as our, as our exports. And like every other, like every other country, or pretty well every other country, we have serious issues about intellectual property theft, about not being able to invest in China in the same way they can invest, often in a predatory way in Britain. Um, what we should look at is the number of things that we're, a number of areas where we're dependent, excessively dependent on China, and decide whether we can't uh, uh, make a change. We're, we're excessively dependent in a lot of pharmaceutical areas. We're excessively dependent in, in antibiotics, for example. We're probably excessively dependent in some technological spheres. So we have to look at those um, economic um, areas in order to make sure that we can act um, as a more as a more independent country, even while working with allies, allies who are prepared to behave sensibly with us and trade sensibly with us, we can't simply sign up to um, to, to deals which um, help the other person much more than they than they help us. As for whether Brexit um, has contributed as well as the coronavirus, yeah, I think I think to some extent. Um, I think that um, a lot of people think that. Uh, the fact that we seem to be so keen on on not just leaving the European Union, but leaving so on any conceivable terms, perhaps with some people thinking that whatever the consequences, if they're bad, they'll be blamed on the outcome of the coronavirus, not um, uh, looked at in their own right. I think there is, it, it must be the case that other countries look at that and say, well, um, maybe, they're, they're <clears throat> maybe they'll need us more now than they, than they did before. But the idea that, uh, that what we should be looking for in order to replace a market which is 44% or more of our exports, what we should be looking for is a fantastic trade deal with China. I'll tell you this, LBC poll this week on Monday, they asked about Brexit. But one of the questions they asked about was whether the answer was to have a really good trade deal with, with um, China. Fewer than 10% thought that was a good idea. 34% said that any trade deal with China should be pursued with the very greatest caution. So what China is managing to do is to make us more grown up about um, some of these issues. And I guess um, that in due course, though not without a good deal of pain, um, we'll find ourselves in that position as well because of Brexit.
There's quite a lot of questions coming in, Chris, about how, what sort of action can be taken to contain China. Bill Emmett, former editor of The Economist, uh, who is now a Brexit exile in Dublin and, and very welcome, uh, asked if next January the US president is Joe Biden, what sort of containment could be undertaken with allies of China? And another person who spent 20 years in Hong Kong, uh, Jeremy Godfrey, uh, talks about how heartbreaking it is to have friends in Hong Kong and also wondering what sort of action can be taken for bad behaviour. So just in that whole area of uh, what action can be taken and how optimistic can we be that action is going to have an impact? Well, I imagine um, and certainly hope that a Biden presidency would first of all reopen the question of America's participation in the TPP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership and would help to rejuvenate that idea and would also provide a, a, an option of European countries, I don't just mean EU countries, I include us as well, um, actually having um, some sort of relationship with TPP. I imagine that a Biden presidency would also be better at rejuvenating and reviving the quad of Australia, um, uh, United States, Canada, India, um, in, uh, in, in, which is a more of a security relationship. And I imagine it would also um, be better at reviving the Five Eyes um, relationship as well. But above all, um, what I would hope that, that Mr. Biden would do um, and his, his colleagues would try to work with our partners in shaping um, an agenda for dealing with China, which didn't press for another Cold War, but did, as I said earlier, um, reward China when it behaved well, but made sure that there was a price to pay when it didn't. And one of the, what some of the prices you'd have to pay would be in terms of where the Chinese were allowed to invest, uh, what they were allowed to do in your own countries. With uh, we, know, we know from some of the work that's been done in Australia, from a, from a book that's been published there, and it's now being about to be published in the UK, despite legal action being taken against it, and it's been published, I think, in Canada, showing the way um, Chinese influence can distort institutions and in attempts to make sensible policy. So I don't think it's impossible for the world to actually work together. But, but I, I, I think it's pretty, ins pretty awful that when, when um, uh, a Swedish citizen is, is uh, arrested outside China, taken back to China and given 10 or 15 years in prison, when two innocent uh, Canadians are picked up because of an extradition, extradition argument in, in, uh, in Canada, when the Australians um, are picked on and threatened with trade sanctions because of um, the fact that they've, they've argued for a full WHO inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. When those things happen, um, I think the rest of the world or friends of those countries should, should stand up and say, you can't behave like that to our friends. On the whole, we tend to sort of look the other way and hope that, um, hope that it all goes away. Um, and uh, I think it will only go away if China understands that there is a price to pay. But what was the second question? Sorry, was that... No, that, that, that sort of, it, it was a series of questions about how, how, what sort of action can be taken um, if Biden is elected or otherwise, and how optimistic we can be that that's going to have uh, an impact on China. I, I, I think that um, um, what's interesting is the way that um, the Chinese are solidifying political opinion critically um, against the communist regime. Um, I think it takes a certain sort of genius for them to have done that, um, as I said at the outset, but they've certainly achieved it, not least in, in the US. The US, um, the, the latest discussions in Congress are about fast tracking um, young protesters who were threatened with arrest uh, in Hong Kong. A um, remarkable thing to happen um, in, in the American political system at the moment, but, but very welcome. And there's a question here from Ethna McDermott, who's a member of the IIEA, and it's a, it's a very broad question, but I think only you could give it a synthesized answer to it. But what, what are China's overall global current strategic aims at the moment? Oh, oh the, the, main, the main aim, um, as Kevin Rudd is pointing out, the main aim of Chinese policy um, is for the party to stay in power. 
That's the aim. That's aim number one, and aim number two, and aim number three. Um, and what wants to do in order to ensure that that happens is to secure a narrative about its position in the world, um, which uh, uh, which matches that of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so um, at the moment, I think it's very dangerous when we start talking about um, China and the reason and the reasons for standing up to it not to allow that to play into um, the, uh, the Chinese communist um, narrative that this is all about Sinophobia, not about Sinophobia. We should actually be hugely grateful to those doctors in Wuhan who bravely tried to blow up at the outset of the uh, reporting coronavirus and were shut up by the, by the police for, for trying to do so. So it's not about Sinophobia, it's about a real phobia about a totalitarian regime which is cutting loose and behaving badly. I have a question from uh, Louis Brennan, the Professor of Business Studies in Trinity uh, College Dublin, and he asks, what is your view of the apparent willingness of some commercial interests in Hong Kong and elsewhere to side with China? Well, I was asked this the other day, and I said, I guess if you were doing you, if you were trying to run a business in Sicily in the 1940s or 50s or 60s and the mafia came knocking on the door, um, you paid up. And I think that's rather what's been happening. The idea that um, when the appalling C.Y. Leung, the former chief executive of, of Hong Kong, said about HSBC that if they didn't back the security law, you know, there'd be as, as it were, financial trouble for them. Um, and this was well before the national security, before anybody knew what was in it. Um, the idea that we should have responded by saying the Bank of China in London, uh, unless you support us on this or that aspect of policy, and um, we'll make life difficult for you. I mean, but this is the way they do business. And should we go on putting up with this? I think there are two other things I would say about, um, about uh, the way businesses behave. One, understanding that um, I guess you have to, you have to, um, give the uh, mafia its due. Uh, two things. First of all, I hope people in Hong Kong, businesses in Hong Kong, will just remember from time to time that most of the people who run them, even the Chinese people who run them, most of the people who run them have a, another passport in their back pocket. And they should perhaps think a little more of those who work for them who don't have the op option of, of going elsewhere if it, if it all goes wrong. And secondly, they should ask themselves what their customers and clients must think of the fact that they signed up to this law before anybody knew what was in it. Now, I hope they're more careful about their customers and their clients' financial affairs than they are about that. I hope they take rather more care. And I hope that they will um, ask themselves how much serious research they're going to be able to do um, on financial issues, economic issues in China, if they're not allowed um, to say anything which is remotely critical of what's happening in China. I think it's going to have a deadening effect on their ability to do the sort of research which any open and free market depends on. Hong Kong has done incredibly well, partly because of the combination of free flow of information, free flow of capital, and the rule of law. And once you start picking that apart, um, I think it becomes very dangerous. I have a question from Rose Dre, who works with the Department of Foreign Affairs, and she's interested to know what you think of the merger signals between the Foreign Office in London and DFID, uh, and what that signals for UK international relations moving forward. Well, I think it's it's pretty extraordinary in the middle of a of this um, crisis um, to uh, unscramble DFID, which has been a huge success story. The other day, um, shortly after saying how successful DFID was and how much he wanted it to go on being successful, the other day, having said that, um, Boris Johnson then referred to um, it as providing a cash point in the sky as though the money that we provide better than almost anybody else and in more generously than most other people for fighting poverty around the world, for trying to 
stop babies dying. Um, as though that was um, a cash point. You can always find, you can always find something that, that looks ridiculous. Um, uh, paying for juggling lessons in the Lebanon or something. You can always find um, problems. Um, but by and large, Diffid has been a fantastic success story. And now it's going to be ripped, um, uh, ripped to pieces and stuffed into the foreign office. Now, I used to be the minister for, for, the, for, for what is now Diffid um, before it was an independent cabinet level department. And we used, of course, to cooperate with the Foreign Office um, and cooperated very well. You can cooperate about your strategic intentions for aid flows without destroying the organization which is doing it. it was, I thought it was interesting, the, the, the example that um, Mr. Johnson gave for doing it was that um, uh, we spent so much more money on, in Zambia than we did in the Ukraine. Well, we spend more money in Zambia than we do in the Ukraine because there are more poor people in Zambia. And overseas development assistance is about helping the poor. And there are criteria um, which are policed very carefully by the OECD for defining overseas development, which take account of what you're doing. So you can't, for example, define as overseas development assistance providing other people in Ukraine, however much there might be an argument for that. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's intellectually uh, muddled. I think, it's I think it's a really unnecessary um, uh, fuss during the, during a, at a time when we should be really f focusing on dealing with the international implications of this virus and of Chinese behavior. Um, I think it threatens what is generally regarded as one of Britain's best exports, that neighbor, na namely our overseas development administration. And when you look at it, the only reason for doing it must be to transfer money from development assistance to other things. Um, and I think that's lamentable. Chris, I think we only have time for one more question. So faced with quite a lot of questions, I'm going to ask one myself. Um, which is, uh, you know, Boris Johnson became Prime Minister a year ago. Uh, and I suppose as Chancellor of Oxford, you're used to the termly reports that students are given, um, whatever they're called in the different colleges. But uh, if you were giving um, an annual report to Boris Johnson in his first year in office, uh, how would you summarise it? Well, he was always, uh, he always clearly resented the fact that um, his contemporary David Cameron got a first um, and he got a second. Um, which is one of the reasons why he called, even when he was prime minister, he called David Cameron a girly swat, as though he rankled, this had rankled all these years that he didn't get as good a degree as Cameron. I think he'd be lucky to get a second, don't you? Um, <laughs> I, I think that, um, I think that to be charitable, um, I don't think being prime minister during this period has tested his political skills and capacities, whatever they may be. Um, and uh, I commend to any who haven't read it, um, except with what it says about China. I commend an article about um, Boris Johnson, um, Bertie Mount, um, who's no lefty, in the current edition of the London Review of Books. And I also recall what, um, uh, well, I, I won't go into the other articles I, I agree with. I, I've never been, as you know, the greatest fan of, of uh, Boris Johnson, but I hope he somehow gets Britain through this awful era. And we've had at the moment one of the worst records in dealing with it in the world. It's called being world beating. Um, and I hope we don't follow that with one of the worst records of getting out of the pandemic economically. But I, I look at um, the performance of Mr. Varadkar and uh, his colleagues, though I know he's now sh in a coalition, I look at that record with a good deal of envy. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of the hour. It passed very quickly. I'd like, first of all, to thank the audience, because I think the quality of the questions was a sign of how uh, thriving the IIA EA is, um, but above all, I'd like to thank you for your openness and for your interesting 
uh, presentations. Um, you're obviously very passionate, and you've spoken about this before, about the threats to liberal democracy. Uh, we have to wait and see how optimistic we can, we can be about that. But certainly the fact you're grappling with those issues is a reason for optimism. And the other thing that just in conclusion struck me is that you, know, you, you obviously have huge knowledge uh, and wisdom about many, many specific areas. But one of the, the great things is the interconnectedness of your wisdom. The way, for example, you identified three specific uh, learnings from setting up the PSNI that could be applied to a completely different situation in, in North America. I, I think that's, that's a fascinating aspect of, of, of your presentation to us and your reply to the question. So, Chris, on behalf of all of us and on behalf of the IAEA, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Thank, thanks very much. Um, just two final thoughts. First of all, I can't remember who first said um, that you can lock up people, but you can't lock up an idea. And secondly, I remember that I'm, I'm, I'm unfashionably these days still a, still a passionate admirer of Thomas More rather than Thomas Cromwell. And I remember that passage um, which Robert Bolt writes in A Man for All Seasons. When More is dealing with Roper and trying to explain to Roper why even the devil um, needs, needs to have recourse to the law. And he says to Roper, you cut down all the laws and you turn England into, bar into a barren area and who protects you then from the wind? And I hope that's um, true about Hong Kong. I hope something will protect it from the wind. Well, Robert Bowles also puts uh, other words in Thomas More's mouth. He says, uh, God made animals to serve him in their innocence, plants to serve him in their simplicity, but man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. So thank you for serving us all in the tangle of your mind, Chris. Thanks, thank everyone.